I'm like, wow, okay, I'm definitely going to preach from Habakkuk because Habakkuk starts with the words, how long, O Lord? And uh, yes, how long? But then on top of the pandemic, we now have a lot of unrest. We have riots, we have looting, we have cop cars burning in the streets of Austin. And just this week, you know, my... I don't know, lots of pastors are posting lots of things, and I didn't know what to post, and so I just shared scripture. Uh, I just read from Habakkuk, and so that's what I like to do right now, is just read Habakkuk 1. Let's just start at verse um, 2, and read through what I, what I preached through last week. It'll be on the screen for those of you watching online. He says, How long, O Lord, shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you. That word cry, the second time, means to scream out. Violence! And you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. This is like it was written yesterday. <laughs> Therefore, the law is powerless. That word powerless, literally in the Hebrew, it means paralyzed. The law is numb. It's paralyzed. It can't feel the emotions and the feelings of its citizens. The law is paralyzed. Not only can it not feel, but it can't act. It can't move. The law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. There are more wicked people than our righteous people. Therefore, perverse judgment, twisted judgment, laws that protect guilty people proceeds. And, and, and it, to me, as I, as I read that last week, you know, I shared that with you all. I preached on that last week. I preached on how God is okay with statements like that. He includes it in his book. And so Friday night, I was meeting with um, some folks from the church. And I was just saying how amazing, like, Habakkuk really applies to um, where we are right now. And what I'm feeling, personally, that's exactly what I'm feeling. I'm feeling like justice is not working. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling, I'm feeling like, God, like, how long are we going to have to put up with, with this craziness? How, like, God, when are you going to step in and do something? Specifically, I, I don't expect uh, the world uh, and the world's systems to ever be very just. As they're, they're founded on humanism. And so humanism always becomes self-destructive. But I do long for the day when God raises up the church and the church makes a difference and revival comes to the church and, 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 and the wicked don't surround the righteous anymore. I long for the day when the righteous surround the wicked. And uh, I was sharing that with somebody on Friday night from our church and they were sharing about how um, they had shared a post on Facebook and it was kind of a long post and it was honestly just sharing their feelings about how they felt about this time especially after the, the George Floyd um, video and the several other videos for years, actually, right? And um, this, this person was just sharing, they're tired, they're frustrated, and they just, they, 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 they just don't know what's coming next. And I, I'm probably slaughtering their post. It was a bit of a long post, but she was, they, they were just sharing their heart, right? And, and they were saying about how awesome it was that so many people from City Chapel just commented underneath just just words of support words of encouragement words of empathy and um, they said that in their other church that that they that would not have been welcomed um, because there is a type of faith there's a type of faith that is really not faith it's it's just positive thinking there's a type of faith that just uh, only says things which are positive never says things which are negative never says anything like this Violence, Lord, why do you show me iniquity? There's plundering and violence before me. There's strife and contention. There is a type of faith that is absent of any questions of any doubt. And that type of faith is very weak. That type of faith relies on a positive confession all the time. And it cannot handle reality. So it shoves reality out of the way. And it doesn't want to hear about how people are feeling. It doesn't want to hear what people are going through. It doesn't want to hear about the injustices of the world. Rather, it's just, all right, well, just, you know, you might see it, but hey, God's on the throne. He's in charge. Everything's going to be okay. All right, that's the kind of faith. It's just, that's all they got to say. 
And this person was saying that it was encouraging that City Chapel is allowing them to express themselves and actually reading scriptures that express the very exact same thing that they're expressing. Frustration, anger, exhaustion, uh, just over it, just done with it, just, just can't take it anymore. God, how long are we going to have to put up with this? Because that's the kind of God we serve. And the kind of faith that is, that is rooted in merely positive thinking will not get you through hard times. Because there will come a time at which you won't think positively. You will try your hardest. But everything you see in front of you is just so negative that you have to reconcile that with your faith. And this is what Habakkuk is doing. He's not denying reality. He's stepping into reality, and he's bringing that reality to God. So, so, so just if you're taking notes, one thing, if you are feeling burdened, if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling angry, if you're feeling, feeling sorrowful, that feeling is valid, and that feeling is okay. But you must take that feeling to God. You cannot take it to the streets you cannot take it to other people's businesses. You cannot take it to other people. You cannot take it just merely to Facebook. You cannot take it, you cannot merely make noise. I mean, you can, but if you just make noise, you'll never make a difference. So the, the real difference makers are the ones that know where to take their sorrow, where to take their pain. They take it to God. They lay it. That's what, that's what Habakkuk says. How long, Lord, shall I cry to you? I am going to cry out to God. I'm going to bring earth to doorstep and that's what he does with it so the safe place to take these feelings and these thoughts and these these anxieties is to the doorstep of heaven is to God to bring them before God and secondly the safe place is God's people the church ought to be a safe place to bring these thoughts the church ought to, because we ought to be uh, we are the body of Jesus like we're his, we are him we are his body we are his hands and his feet we're his face his eyes like we are the body of Christ and so when when people are suffering they ought to be able to come into the church and share this very thing God included it in his scripture even though it's not true because he says Lord you don't save and you don't hear well that's not technically true it feels true. It seems true at the moment. And God allowed what seemed true to a weeping prophet to be included in his scripture because what seems true to you right now is very important to God. How you feel is very important to God. It's not the most important thing, but it's very important. You can bring it to God. And when you bring it to God, then you, 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 you are basically saying that the most important thing is that I hear from God. So the most important thing isn't simply that I express myself, which my generation loves to do all the time. And the church hasn't been that good at it. But the rest of the world, you go out there and everybody's really, really great at it. They're, they're, they're pros at expressing themselves. They, like they're gonna, they, they, they do that all day, all, every day. But, but what Habakkuk is doing is he's expressing himself to God because to him, the most important thing is that he hear from God. And that is, to me, the most important thing as well, that we hear from God. We can express ourselves, and I want to give some space to do that Wednesday night, because in the church we haven't been that great at it. I want to give some space to do that, but ultimately we must hear from God. And so in verse 5, Habakkuk hears from God. Seems like for the first time ever. So if we go to verse 5, God answers him. And he, he, he doesn't, uh, God's so funny, he doesn't uh, recognize what he's saying. He doesn't empathize with him. He immediately speaks to the very thing that Habakkuk is worried about. And this is how God rolls. He will immediately speak to the very deepest concern of your heart. He's not superficial. So he jumps right to the center of it. He says, Habakkuk, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. He jumps right to where Habakkuk is, and he gives him instruction right off the bat. He says, look. Now, I don't do a lot of um, Hebrew uh, reading, 
Uh, I grew up studying New Testament Greek, and so for me, when I study the Old Testament, I, I, I look at the Hebrew words, but honestly, I understand the Septuagint better. The Septuagint is the Greek um, translation from the Hebrew. So about 300 years before Christ came to earth, uh, Hellenism, Greek uh, language was spreading across the globe, and so scribes took the Hebrew scriptures, they translated it into Greek for a Greek reading world. And um, actually, several manuscripts are that we have older manuscripts of the Septuagint than we do of the of the original Hebrew. So I often go back to the Septuagint. That's a little background information for you. The, but the Septuagint, the word here, he says when he says "look among the nations," so God's instruction to Habakkuk is "look." And that word "look," it's epi blepo. Uh, so it's two words. Blepo means to look. Um, but but it's not just blepo. Blepo would be open your eyes. And observe. That's what blepo means. But epi blepo, epi, epi means to look around. So literally, God gives Habakkuk instruction right off the bat. He says, I hear you, all right? I, I hear you, and I'm going to answer you. I'm going to give you some instruction that's going to help you, Habakkuk. Look around. Look around. So this is, this, is my, this is my encouragement to you today. If you're watching online, and you're feeling anxious, and you're feeling angry, if you're here in the room and you're, you don't know how to feel and you're dealing with so many things, God's instruction to a weeping, mourning prophet was look around. Specifically, look around among the nations. Everything Habakkuk is complaining about has to do with his particular nation. And actually, the half of the nation which he lives in called Judah, the, the, the southern part. So, Habakkuk is complaining to God about the violence and the injustice happening in front of him. And if, and if you're not careful, you can get so caught up, come on somebody, with what is in front of you. In fact, you can live kind of like this. You can live with what is in front of you. You can live with what is in front of you being so important to you that it consumes your entire prayer life. You only talk to God about what's, what's, what's in front of you. You only are concerned about what is in front of you. And if you think that's not true, just go on your timeline and look on what was in front of you last year. And you've already forgotten about it, but last year at that time, it was so, 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 so important. I mean, you know, we're coming up to an election season, and every election is the most important election we've ever faced. Have you noticed that? Okay, fine. Nobody else has. I've lived a little. I'm 40 years old. Every election in my entire life, from Bill Clinton to George W. to Obama, has always been. I mean, if 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 if, if the wrong guy gets in, it's got the Antichrist is right, and he's the it's coming right around the corner. We gotta. It, everything is so important. I mean, it's so important until the next thing comes in front of you and then that's so important until the next thing and then that's so important this is this, this is one of my concerns is that is that people are, are 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 rioting and protesting and looting not because of injustice not because they feel for the injustice that's happening because injustice has been happening it's more like they, they this that's what's right in front of them right now and if the narrative changes and if something else gets put in front of them then they'll stop caring about the injustice and they'll, they'll move over to whatever the next thing is in front of them. And we as humans, we are, we are conditioned to be obsessed with what is in front of us because we were made to dwell in the presence of God, to gaze in what is in front of us and that being Him. But when we were kicked out of the garden, when we, when we left the presence of God, suddenly what is in front of us is variable and it's different for each and every one of us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to His own way. So there's something in front in front of you and there's something in front of you and there's something in front of me and there's different things and whatever is in front of us that's what we are obsessed with that's what we're worried about that's what we're praying about that's what we're saving up for that's what we're going to spend our money on that's what we're planning for and, 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 and it might be a good thing it might be a bad thing it might be a disease it might be a pandemic but whatever's in front it's amazing how people aren't social distancing anymore Hold on a second. Three weeks ago, this was really important. I mean, we were all going to die if we got within, you know, four feet of each other. Like, ooh, uh, uh. But now, all of a sudden, 
It's interesting. Whatever's in front of us yells the loudest to us, and we get so obsessed and confronted with it. And nowadays, at what can be in front of you is right in your hands, in your cell phone or in your tablet or in your laptop. And, and what's in front of you has so much power over you. And what God is saying to Habakkuk, first off, he says, before, before I even go into details, just look around. Don't be a captive to what's in front of you. Don't be held as a slave to whatever the current media narrative is. Don't be held as a slave to whatever is on your timeline. But look around. God has never been held captive to what is in front of him. Like he, 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 he lives in a type of freedom that we as humans don't understand, right? Because like, like Jesus is teaching 5,000 people, 5,000 men, plus who knows how many women and children, and they're all on the, 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 the side, and they're getting hungry. And the disciples see the hunger of the people. That's what's in front of them. And so they forget about the teaching of Jesus. <clears throat> they forget about the miracles of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and they go to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, help us with what's in front of us. These people are really hungry. And Jesus cuts right to what's really going on. He says, you know, you're right. How about you give them something to eat? <laughs> and they're like, wow, 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 wow. That's not what we were saying, Lord. <clears throat> we were thinking of sending them away. Because Jesus, yeah, he sees what's in front. He sees the hunger, but he also sees the teaching that he's doing. So Jesus has a wonderful way of never being held captive to what's in front of him. And, and so my challenge to you is, yes, absolutely see injustice, but also look around. There's also good police officers out there. There's also good laws out there. There's also good people out there. Yes, see, uh, see the rioting and the looting, but there's also good protesters out there. There's also good people that are truly angry and have good reason to be angry. And that's okay for them to be angry. Like, uh, like if, you, if you just step back for just a second, we, we lose focus and we lose track of what God is doing when we allow what's in front of us to dictate how we live and how we react and how we pray. But rather, if what's in front of you doesn't line up with what he said, then you need to look around. If there's, if there's, if there's an issue, so, so the disciples have hunger in front of them, and really the, the real problem is not that they saw the hunger, that was good. The problem was they didn't have anything to, within themselves to feed the hunger. They didn't have resources within themselves. That's why it's good to go to Jesus. So they go to Jesus because they don't have what is necessary. The, 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 the injustice and the sorrow and the anger that is in front of us right now in our country. Many of us are feeling the emptiness of resources to speak to that or to help that or to alleviate that. And so, so many times our response is just like the disciples. We need to send them away for them to go get help somewhere else. And yet Jesus said, no, wait a second, hold on. I am the bread of life. How about you give them something to eat? Jesus, we don't have anything to give them. And Jesus starts looking around. Right? The, the guy in front of him, Peter, didn't have anything. John didn't have anything. Matthew didn't have... So Jesus starts looking around. And he finds a kid. Right? Not a part of the 5,000 men. This is a child. Not even listed. Not even numbered. Not in front. That's not the, the... The kid's not who the disciples were thinking about. Kids can go hungry, but these men over here, if they get hungry, they're going to take their whole family and leave. So, so we need to feed them. And Jesus looks around and finds a child with a small lunch. And you, you, it's amazing the kind of provision that God has already placed around you. This is why God says to Habakkuk, man, I see that you're worried. I see that you're anxious. I see that you're weeping. But you need to look around because I'm doing more than, what, than just simply what is in front of you. The circumstance in front of you does not tell the whole story of what is happening around you. And so you need to look around. Epi blepo. You need to look all the way around. You need to turn around because the resources that you need are within your grasp if you'll just look around. And here's this kid with his little lunch. Jesus looks around, finds a kid, breaks it, blesses it, and sends it out and feeds the multitude with what was around him. 
And I believe that, that God has that very same thing for us. I believe that on a, on, a, on a very you know, civic level, on a very natural level, that's true. But also on a spiritual level, if you're dealing with anxiety, if you're dealing with fearfulness, if you're, if you're dealing with shame, if you're dealing with feelings of guilt, if you're dealing with sin in your life, if you're dealing with addiction, you, you can get so obsessed with what's in front of you. And I, want, I think God is just like, hey, why don't you look around? Why don't you look around? Because, because like... <laughs> When you take time, that's, that's why I love the song that we sang today, The Goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. Well, wait a minute, that's that, all my life. <clears throat> I'm 40 years old now, so that's been that's 1980. Well, what am, I, what am I thinking about when I sing that song? I'm not thinking about last night in Austin. I'm thinking about all my life you have been. I'm thinking about 92 in 94 or as some of you think of the late 1900s <clears throat> I'm thinking of you know like I, I'm, 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 I'm looking back this is why the psalmist says in Psalm 23 surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life many of us you know that, that part of the passage doesn't make any sense to us because we want mer- goodness and mercy to be in front of us all the days of our life and yet the psalmist says actually it is following me so what's in front of me may be grief what's in front of me may be problems what's in front of me may be difficulty but when I turn around what's behind me is goodness and mercy is the faithfulness of God and so it's so important Habakkuk that when you get stuck into what's in front of you when you get worried about what's in front of you you get overwhelmed by what's in front of you that you learn how to epi blepo like look around pick your head up away from what's in front of you and start looking around at the goodness of God hasn't he been good hasn't he been faithful hasn't he brought you through so much already and this is what people, I mean, down through history, all through the scripture, you're going to see this as, as you start to realize that God is constantly telling people to look around, right? Abraham, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. Talk about a tough, difficult thing in front of you. The next morning, he didn't even, he didn't even let him, you know, celebrate a birthday or Christmas or nothing. He said, tomorrow morning, I want you to get up and take your son uh, to a mountain. I'm going to show you and kill him there. You guys watched this last week in kids' church. Yeah. And, and, he, and, he's, and, 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 and so the, can you imagine going to bed that night as Abraham? Knowing what you are about to do. He gets up in the morning. He gets his son Isaac. And Isaac says, okay, we got all this stuff for the... For the, for, the, for the offering, but we don't have a lamb, and Abraham can't bring himself to what God told him, so instead he says God will provide a lamb. Now, now he's not lying. He's just not being specific. <laughs> and, 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 he's, and, he's, and because in his mind he knows who God is, that God is a provider, in his mind he knows that God does not believe in, in human sacrifice. God hates human sacrifice. He knows that God hates it. And he knows that God is a provider. Plans for Isaac. He knows that God God already told Abraham the plans that he had for Isaac. And so he knows all those things to be true, which is why in Hebrews, it actually says that Abraham was one of the first people to ever believe in the resurrection because when he was taking his son up to the mountain, he basically thought in his mind, God is going to have to raise him from the dead to fulfill the promises that he made about him. So he knows these things to be true of God, but he sees this thing in front of him, which does not agree with what he knows to be true of God. And the whole way up the mountain, He's walking in obedience. And when he gets up there, you know, he, he raises the knife over his son. That's when God stops him and says, Abraham, don't touch the boy. Now I know that you, that you value me, that, you serve, that you'll serve me. And then he looked around. <laughs> and that's when he saw the ram stuck in the bush. And, he w- and God provided a sacrifice. God provided a ram. It's, it's crazy, like, when I, when I think of God's, like, aerial Google Earth view, you know, he, like, Abraham had no way of knowing that ram was there. But it was, it was on the, it was on, it was, it was around him. He had no way. The whole time Abraham is down here, 
he's walking up the mountain with his son right and then on the other side of the mountain god gets a ram and says all right so you you need to get going that way and the ram starts climbing up the mountain and the whole way the ram's climbing up the mountain Abraham and Isaac are on the other side of the mountain. You don't know what God's doing on the other side. You don't know what's around. Sometimes you, the only thing you can see in front of you is the sacrifice that's coming is the top of the mountain, and you are so... I'm, I, I bet he walked so slow up that mountain. I mean, like, if I were Abraham, I would have stopped and had lunch, breakfast, dinner. We would have celebrated, you know, Hanukkah or whatever he was celebrating back in the day. Like, we would have had... Like, it's going to take me a while to get up the mountain. But the whole way he's working up the mountain, at the exact same time, there's the provision on the other side of the mountain. And so many times we don't see the provision of God because we don't fully walk in obedience to God. Like we're on the side of the mountain and we're looking around over here. Like so, um, any, any, any rams? Any, 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 anything? You're not going to see it on this side of obedience. You're not going to see it on this side. You only see it when you get to the place that God called you to go. When you get here, when you step up into full obedience, this is where you begin to see. You can look around, and you can see that God, all my life, he has been faithful. Even when I couldn't see it, he was working. And even when I couldn't feel it, he was moving. All my life, he's been faithful. As I was walking up one side of the mountain with my head low, you know, uh, just dreading the moment that I get here, he was sending my provision up the other side of the mountain, trying to time it, trying to keep that, that goat busy because I was taking so long. And the, the goat had to run circles on the side of the mountain. He was probably up and down a few times. And yet, and yet God is patient and by the time I got up here, he's taking care of me. All my life I've been faithful. He's taking, uh, here at City Chapel, like the couple I was talking to Friday night, like God took them from so much, literally other, like countries and states and cities and bringing them, and it's no accident. The timing of God is no accident. The positioning of God is no accident. You're not in Austin accidentally. The positioning and the timing of God is no accident. But, 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 but you got to. So, so I, I guess if you can't see anything around you, my advice is to keep walking. Keep climbing. Keep being obedient. Because as his obedience grows and grows, he comes to a place where he can look around. And he sees goodness and mercy tracking with him all the days of his life. So many times when we cry out to God, we want specific instructions from him as to what to do, how to fix the problem. I love the fact that when God responded to Habakkuk, he didn't give him one thing to do to actually fix the injustice. He, he didn't say, okay, so here's your three-step program to deal with injustice. In fact, God just simply said, look around. And, and he said, he, be astounded. Uh, as, I, as I read that this week, I thought, man, I've been astounded for about two and a half months. About three months, I've just been just dumbfounded. Just, I can't believe it. I can't believe this is happening. This is crazy. And then it gets crazier. And then the, the killer wasps, you know, and who knows? What, like, like, what next? I don't know. Like, like, somebody posted, like, what chapter of Revelation are we in this week, you know? It's like, it's getting crazy out there. Look around and be astounded. Like, I can associate. But actually what he's saying, though, is he says, look and be utterly astounded. Now, that word utterly astounded, it's actually in the Hebrew, it's, it's the same word twice. It's be astounded and be astounded. Which, once again, I'm not good at Hebrew, so I was like, that's weird. So I went to the Greek, and it actually means be astounded at that which is astounding. Or wonder at the wonder that I'm about to work. So much of Habakkuk in, in, in verses uh, 2 through 4, uh, 2, 3, and 4, is Habakkuk wondering at the evil in front of him. How long will this go on? Why am I seeing this? Why is this happening? What in the world is happening? He's wondering. He's looking at what's in front of him, and he is, he is transfixed. He is astounded at that. And what God tells him, he says, I want you to look around, and I want you to start to wonder at the wonder that I'm working. 
So stop wondering at the problem. Stop wondering at the situation. Stop wondering at the strife. Stop wondering at the lawlessness. And start wondering at the wonder that I am working. He literally says, when you, if you could pick your head up for just a minute and you look around, you are going to be astounded at what I am doing. So God doesn't give Habakkuk a three-step program how to bring justice. Rather, he tells Habakkuk the stuff he is doing to bring justice. And he says, your job is just to stand in wonder of what I'm doing. Your job is to stand in awe of me. And this is something that uh, growing up in church all my life, you know, I, I, I went to church for the first time when I was two weeks old and never left. <laughs> um, yeah, every time the doors were open, that was my family's motto. And um, I don't know, I've noticed as I've uh, been an adult uh, from the first time that Ro and I first got, from the first time that, from when we got married, the first time I actually lived on my own with another human being, and we're trying to figure out what God wants us to do, and where he wants us to live, and where, what, what church I should go be a part of, and work at, and I had all these offers, and we were driving around the country, and we finally, uh, God finally spoke to us, it took him a long time, um, finally spoke to us about living in the, helping this church in Nashville, and so um, we lived just south of Franklin, Tennessee, and we were, the church was actually in Franklin, just south of Nashville, and we were too poor to live in Franklin, so we lived <laughs> below that, and uh, we were helping this church and serving at this church, and it didn't take very long for the, the place that God, that we thought God told us to go to, for us to start questioning whether or not we heard God right. I don't know if you've ever been there, but uh, you finally, yes, God speaks to you. Now everything's going to be awesome. No, no, not so much. Now your faith will be tested. So we, we, we moved to this church. We, we moved there to help the church, and things were not going at all like how we thought they should and, or like how we thought they would. And so, and so, and so, we're, so we're there. We're there, but we don't know what's going on. Um, and I remember it was so difficult sometimes. I would, I would just pray and I would just say, God, um, can, you, can, can you help me? Uh, help me figure this out. Am I in? Because really, I just want to know I'm in the right place. Let me know I'm in the right place. Let me know, and then, and then I'm good. If I can just know. And I, and I guess, you know, all my life, he's been faithful. But all my life, I've been a little fearful <laughs> that I'm missing it. You know, that I'm not where I'm supposed to be, that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I'm like, God, am I, and maybe you guys haven't struggled with that, but that's a, maybe that's just a Christian, like, growing up in the church kind of thing. It's like, because if you're not in the will of God, that's really bad. So you got to get in the will and make sure you're in the will of God. And so he's got to tell you, like, every five seconds that you're there, otherwise you don't know, right? And so I was like, Lord, like, and, and I was just praying about this. And a friend of mine who actually lived in Texas um, was finding uh, feathers all around his house, dove feathers. All around his house and he's like isn't that cool and I'm like Lord how come you can't do something cool like that for me this dude's finding dove feathers um, you know like I would like I would like something just to know that I am where I'm supposed to be and um, it was so interesting I've shared this before at City Chapel but uh, it was so interesting after like that very week after I prayed that prayer um, I began finding a lot of dimes uh, just everywhere in random places and um, I thought, well, that's, that's weird. I don't usually pick up change that I find because I was a germaphobe before um, COVID-19. So I'm always like, I don't know where that's been. Um, but these are like always shiny dimes. Like I'm walking into Walmart, the door opens, there's a shiny dime right there on the floor. And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And, and, and it's just kind of weird. And I just left a lot of them because I didn't want to pick them up. And, uh, you know, and some things I can, you can make sense of, like you get out of the car, your parking lot, you get out of the car, and it falls out. It falls out of your pocket, maybe. Okay. So the ones I found sort of in those areas, I, I didn't give much stock to, but I began kind of wondering, like, this is weird. I'm finding a lot of dimes lately. And then, and then Ro asked me about that because she was finding a lot of dimes around the house because at that time I was going to work and um, she was uh, staying around the house. And it was weird because she would, like, vacuum the house, vacuum the, the closet, and then go back in the closet to put some clothes away, and there would be a dime on the, like, it, the, the door of the, the walk-in closet. And um, she would clean the, the, the countertops and then come back and find a dime on the countertop. So she had a bag full of dimes that she had found, and she's like, I've been finding all these dimes. Like, what? And I said, well, that's really strange. I've been finding a lot of dimes, too. And so we began to talk and realize that maybe God's, like, dropping dimes or something. 
And it's totally weird, and uh, I, it's not in the Bible, so I don't know about it. Um, but, we, but we said, look, so we prayed that night, and we laid in bed, and we just prayed together, Lord, if this is you, you know, I don't know, like, let us know. So, of course, you know, you ask for a sign, God gives you a sign, then you ask for a sign to validate the sign. All my life I have been fearful. Uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> Like, Lord, really, 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 really? So anyway, so, 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 so the next morning, we're making the bed. This is before we had kids. Um, but uh, we're making the bed in the morning, because nowadays it's the last one up makes the bed. You just throw it together. But um, back when we were, didn't have kids, we got to wake up leisurely and then just make the bed ourselves. And So we're making the bed together, and, and I, I pull back my pillow, and under my pillow is a dime. Under my pillow, a shiny dime. And I'm like, What? So at that point, we realized, I think maybe God is trying to say something. And so that began a journey for us of just praying about, God, what are you saying about these dimes? And one of the things that, that, that we, we, conclusions that we came to is, one, that God is not as concerned about the place that we're in as we are, but rather that God is deeply concerned with communicating something to us. And every time I would see a dime, I would sense, and this is just my sense, this isn't in the Bible, but I would sense that, that God was smiling. Which is sort of like what God tells Habakkuk. Look among the nations. Habakkuk's like, yes, okay, I'm going to be able to do something. He's like, no, no. Just look and wonder at what I'm doing. And so every time I would find these dimes, I felt like God was just saying, look, I love you. I'm like, yeah, God, but I want to know where I'm supposed to be, how long I'm supposed to be there. And I, I love you. It was, it was more like, I just want you to look and wonder at me. Because isn't it amazing that I love you? I mean, you're pretty lovable, but come on. <laughs> isn't it amazing? <laughs> that was, we're singing about the, the love of God. Isn't it amazing? Have you, have you got so callous? He forgot how amazing the fact that God loves us. And not only loves me, but he knew I was going to go to Walmart at that particular time on that particular day, and he dropped a dime. And, and, and throughout, I mean, you, you might think I'm weird and leave the church because you don't want to be a part of a weird church, and that's fine. I, I totally get it. Um, but seriously, we've, 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 we've told people about this, and it always happens in times of transition, in times of worry, in times of stress. God never tells us exactly what to do. He just tells us that he, he loves us and he sees us. We were, we were talking to a couple after our house flooded. We were telling them about the dimes because after our house flooded, we started seeing a lot more dimes. Which, by the way, to pay for a new house, you need more than dimes. Just saying, Lord. If you could drop some Benjamins down, that would help me out. But it's not about that. He's not trying to pay for a house. He, he provided, absolutely, in amazing ways. But that's not what the dimes are about. The dimes are about, I see you, Harry. I love you. We were telling a couple about this. We were in our flooded house, and we were all standing around in a circle because they were helping us strip back the sheetrock. And as we were telling them about the dimes, we heard a ting, ting, ting right in the middle of us. Like a, a, a dime dropped out of nothing. Literally. And you might believe me, you might not. They, I think they thought I threw it because they were like, <laughs> they were like, and I was like, what's that? And I looked at it, like, I, it was, I'm not that quick. I've never been a good magician, because I'd be like, yeah, you know, it doesn't work for me. But it just, out of air, just dropped. There have been several times, like, I was praying for Noah's dad one time, and um, we were praying and on, on his property, and I just sensed God to say that God wanted to give him a sign that he loves him. Because he also grew up in the church, so he, he struggles with some of the same things I struggle with. Because you, you grow up in the church, you think God needs you, but maybe he doesn't love you. You know, he wants you to work. But anyway, so you, you get those confused, right? And so I just, I was praying for him, and, I, and we were out on, on, on his family's property, and, or his wife's family's property, and we were praying for him. And I just prayed that. I said, God, I pray that you give him a sign. I said, maybe even drop a dime in his life. And, of course, he doesn't know what that is, and that probably sounded weird. And um, Anyway, so we walk outside, and uh, we're sitting down ready to say goodbye. And on, underneath the table, I said, hey, look, this is for you. It's just one of those weird things and uh, that God used for me 
And now, now people get really off on that, and they, they're like, oh, I, I went to an apartment, I saw a dime, God must want me to move to, you know, wherever. And it's like, well, no, it's not, it's not, about, it's not about what you're doing. In fact, why, why, don't you just, why don't you just break the religious spirit right now over your life and just say, I am loved. Right there in your living room. Just go ahead and say it out. Say, say it all, let's say it together. I am loved. And I am seen. And I am provided for. Sometimes you just have to say that over yourself. Because it's true. And God has done so many wonderful things to show me that. And dimes was like one of those things. And maybe he'll do that for you too. I don't know, maybe... Maybe if you, if you ask him. But it's, but it's not about exactly, Lord, what should I do to fix the stuff in my nation? Although I think it's good to ask those questions amongst ourselves. But I think what God really wants us to do is to w- stop wondering at the evil in front of us and start wondering at what God is doing. So, Father, I do. I pray that you would envelop your people today. Hmm. Maybe it is dimes, and you've shown me that you can drop these out of thin air. Uh, you can place them wherever you want. But you can do other things, too. Apparently, dove feathers, you can... I think it was Gideon laid out a fleece, and there was dew on it, and then the next day he laid out a fleece, and there was no dew on it. So you do, you do strange things sometimes just to get through to us. So Lord I, Lord, I do pray for that, for everybody watching right now. So many of us are anxious, we're hurting, we're, we're fearful. All my life I have been fearful. But all my life you've been faithful. <laughs> and you never stopped loving me, no matter what I did or where I was. I have always been loved. I've always been seen. And you have always provided for me. Sometimes I had to climb the hill of obedience to find the provision, but you have always provided for me. And you will provide for me now. Lord, I pray that you would wrap your arms around each person in this room, each person watching online. Lord, let us sense the goodness of God. That's, that's, that, that's what the dime is for me. It is to see the goodness of God. I believe it, and I feel it sometimes, but boy, it's helpful to see it. Boy, it's a faith booster to reach down and pick it up. <laughs> for you to give, deposit something to me. You who are running the universe. <laughs> you who are commanding angels that are battling with demons, you who are dealing with mass starvation in this world, you who are doing so much, you see Harry. You see us. And we are loved by you. We are seen. We are provided for. So Lord, we rest in that. We pray for George Floyd's family. I pray for those uh, close to the situation who have lost and many others who have lost. We pray for the unrest that is in our country right now, for the lack of peace, sin bubbling up to a boiling point. I pray that you would arise, that your enemies would be scattered, that you would bring comfort to those that are mourning, that you would bring peace to those that are at unrest, and most of all, that you would bring the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of God that we need, the rule and reign of God. In his kingdom, there is no racism. In his kingdom, there is no inequality. In his kingdom, there is no injustice. In his kingdom, there is love and peace and joy, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are flowing. These are the colors of his kingdom. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Austin as it is in heaven. 
In Jesus' name, amen.